Okay, thanks, Robin. Okay, comrades, as I said, uh, it's now time for your contributions, Q&A, or your own contributions, to some of the issues that Robin has opened up. Um, we'll take three here first, um, and then three from the spillover rooms, and then also online. Okay, there's one here, Kenneth. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, and also, thanks for a very <coughs> uh, thought-provoking uh, input. I have so much to say, but I think I'll limit it to just maybe two questions. I don't know if there are questions or comments. Uh, the first one would be, not that I'm questioning uh, the, the, the headline of post-liberation, uh, but I do want to say that, you know, can we really call this period a post-liberation period when South Africa, uh, I mean, we are still stuck in the middle of the two states uh, uh, revolution, right? We got political uh, power, but still, you know, economic power is, is, is so far, uh, it's very elusive. And even those political gains are seemingly lost every day. Uh, a good example would be the Marikana massacre. So that would be the first one. Secondly, there's, 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 there's enough critiques on the state, on how capitalism, the state, how you know, inequality and how they drive inequality and poverty. But I don't think there's similar critique on left, grassroots or radical movements and their actions towards uh, uh, poverty and so on. So also maybe there, there must be a limitation or, or maybe some, some madness. But also, yeah, madness I'm using as doing the same thing and expecting different results. Uh, for example, some of us, uh, we are, I'm a housing activist. Uh, and we, some of us do understand that private property is one of the driving forces of inequality. But yet, we do wake up every day to fight, to create movement, to build organization, to own property privately. Uh, so yeah, there must be something also, some critiques towards the left. Thanks. With regards to BRICS, so are we, they were here, you know, and they spoke about issues of the green neocolonialism, Lula, you know, and how green neocolonialism, you know, mustn't be another front for neocolonialism. And then we also know of issues of um, the BRICS Development Bank. We also know about the need for intense capital to develop um, the productive forces of society. And Marx said that we want the production, the development of all productive forces. That means everyone's capacity in here needs to be developed in order to contribute to an economy. Uh, you know that that is able to produce for itself. So, with regards to BRICS and all the rhetoric around it, how, you know, do we just have a pessimistic view towards them, or do we also have some hope in them that they can replace um, the the unfair profit sharing currently done by the West, the global North, the EU, and America, because we also understand with regards to trade, um, we need them, but there is a possibility of them being replaced by the, the Eastern or the BRIC side of things. So what is, how do we navigate uh, those channels? 2024, then it will be 2029 again, you know, and we will be on the ground trying to create a better society, you know, trying to have, so, with regards to the land being owned by the state, because you, you mentioned the, the guy from, I think it's Guyana, um, Guyana that, that took state control to, you know, to oppress. Uh, I think you said that, is, I don't know, if it, so thank you. Is it Guyana or Grenada, the one guy that took state, state ownership of the property, the socialist guy? But thank you, that's my question to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, one more. Thanks. 
Um, firstly, thanks so much for placing us with your uh, lecture there, Prof. I just wanted to ask a question um, specifically with socialist uh, democracy. In terms of liberal democracy, one of the biggest criticisms specifically in South Africa is that the liberal conception of democracy places a very large framework on fundamental and socioeconomic rights to achieving development, which is very Eurocentric, which is one uh, criticism. Another criticism of that very liberal based rights framework is that it places rights to an abstract person or an abstract citizen rather than an actual subjective citizen. The only way to materialize those rights is either based on proximity to the positions of power, proximity to the law, whether you have money or whether you're educated. So in terms of a socialist conception of democracy, how would the rights-based culture of South Africa or any other state that is woven with a liberal framework change the conception of rights within the society from an abstraction to something that is more materialized subjectively to the citizen? You know, um, in 1985, sir, there was an article written in the Teacher's Journal of South Africa, an article that was titled, to release Mandela or to use Mandela. And that article today, we know exactly the outcome of that particular, you know, uh, what you call the article, the essence of it. Why in the face of almost 10 years prior to him becoming president, right, was such an important article missed by people, one, and the next thing is that in the face of, you know, of uh, socialism making its rise, right, or South Africa being a grand example of what real democracy should be like, right, we had everything going for us, right, in face of the, the stand was taken by the Palestinian Liberation Organization of non-negotiation, non-collaboration with the enemy, and so on. Why did we take, and what were the factors that actually made that, top, that type of, 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 of drift, you know, we, we drifted away from that idea of non-collaboration, uh, you know, such a powerful tool that masses of people had, right? in order to liberate people of South Africa. Um, so, so basically, you know, what I'm trying to get at is that in the face of everything else that we as a powerful oppressed people had, why did we give this up? And what were the causal reasons for such a, such a, a thing happening, okay. a catastrophe like that happening? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, you know I can't answer all these questions, right? <laughs> Some I just structurally can't. Um, let me go backwards. Um, the first point you made, I would love to hear your answer to the question in terms of what, about the importance of this article and why it was released. The last part you were making, the point you were making about you know, giving up um, the sort of tactical advantage of non-collaboration I can't speak to decisions in South Africa, but what I can speak to is that this happens everywhere. Everywhere. Um, and part of it is, is a strategic, we don't know it's a strategic error until after the fact. And the places where, uh, the history that I know where, it, where actually there was a refusal to give up that, it's amazing what people are able to win. And this is a small story, but the story of, again, this is a U.S. story, but in Mississippi, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and Fannie Lou Hamer and others were involved, and they basically were given the opportunity to have a kind of presence at the Democratic National Convention, but no real vote, no real seat. And everyone kept saying, this is the opening. If you just take it, you can negotiate for more. And they said no and they left. Now, that doesn't make Mississippi a great place right now, but what it does mean is that they not only left with their dignity, but they were in a stronger position 
uh, in terms of their accountability to their community. They didn't win that fight, but in the long run, they built a movement. So I can't answer the question. Um, um, to go back, again, I'm going backwards. There's two things here. Um, one having to do with uh, well, liberal democracy and its limitations. But one thing is I would, I would make a distinction between development and growth. That in many ways, the, the neoliberal order and the liberal order uh, in the 20th, 21st century focuses on growth, but not development. Development is one of those terms that could actually mean something depending on how we define it, you know. Um, development can mean developing communities where there's a social safety net and protection for everyone. Growth is about numbers, and growth often means the accumulation of capital and its reinvestment, which then trickles up, right? So I think I would make that distinction. Liberal democracy, it has lots of limits. One of the things, of course, as you're saying, is the f idea that the liberal subject is always individual. The liberal subject, you can't think of liberal democracy in terms of whole communities. It's not designed for that. You can build political power. You, could, you can have some form of deliberative democracy or um, participatory democracy among communities, but in the end, under the liberal system, it's representative. You, you sort of elect someone who's supposed to speak for you. And your interests are always tied to your individual interests, not your community interests. And that's why um, what we're seeing now is not even the liberal democracy of the early 20th century, but 21st century liberal democracy is consumer democracy. It is, you know, you're a consumer. And the state is supposed to be a corporation and you have an investment, and the language, you see this language also at university, where um, the, the university or the state or the society in a liberal is, is investing in the individual. And what does the individual have? Capital. So the idea of capital is very much linked, like personal capital, social capital, capital that you as an individual have that you can invest. And worse, um, I, I don't know if you use the term, but people use brand. I, I just, that irks me to say, well, I've got to protect my brand. Well, brand is what you get when you're a slave, right? That's what a brand is. And so the idea that we as individuals are consumers in a, poli in the, in a world of politics, that is the kind of new liberalism that we're facing. So I agree with you. It's, there's a lot of limitations. And again, a lot of it centers on the individual subject. Um, Ken, going back to these two questions about the BRICS, let me just say that it would be great if you know, China, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, I mean, they're all different countries with different kinds of agendas. Um, but wouldn't it be great if these were countries that said, we're going to basically invest social capital uh, or, or finance, or we're going to finance projects with no expectation of return. We're just going to give money. And we're going to, and that's one thing. But more importantly, the most important thing that disturbs me about the way we elevate the BRICS is if you look at every single one of those nations, the one exception might be possibly the direction Brazil is going in under Lula. But other than that, these are deeply unequal countries. China, people elevate China. Um, China does have a command economy. There's certain basic things that are available. But China's working class is suffering in a way that, and, and they're producing products for the globe. And, and the richest people in China are in the Chinese Communist Party. The Communist Party is where you go to become a millionaire. It wasn't like that. <laughs> and so if these countries basically produce a deep level of inequality and exploitation, 
then why should we expect them together to, un to undo, undo that? So I'm not saying that there isn't something really interesting, but I don't think that the bricks replacing the old system is necessarily going to move us away from the neoliberal order. Um, it may do something else, but I'm saying there's got to be a different kind of international system of economy in which housing is a global right, healthcare is a global right, education, good education is a global right. These are just basic things that every single human being should have, and that the protection of the planet, the preservation of the planet, is an obligation of every single nation. And that is, and if, if we can move toward that, that would be in opposition to the direction the BRICS are going. That's all I'm saying. Um, and also, when you look at who's going to join the BRICS, it's, you know, Saudi Arabia? Really? <laughs> I mean, we could talk about Saudi Arabia all, all day long. Um, it has a very vicious history. And I'm talking about in terms of working class within Saudi Arabia. Um, and then finally, the last, let me say the first for last, um, excellent question, can we call this a post-liberation period? Um, I don't, I forget where the question came from, but, um, oh yeah, oh thank you, yeah, I'm so confused. This is an excellent question, and I actually, I was sort of um, suggesting no by saying that when we talk about post-liberation, what has been liberated is capital. So that's what I think about post-liberation. Um, I understand post-liberation as a shorthand for the formal end of apartheid, but if we go back again to Neville Alexander and many others, they had already said, you know, apartheid is not going to end. You cannot end it under the current economic system. It's just impossible. Um, and so, so there's that question. I don't think it's post-liberation. I think we should, we also should think about post-liberation in global terms. Um, because, you know, South Africa is connected to this global economy. And, you know, it's amazing how connected we really are. Um, even when you think about uh, private ownership of land, which was also an issue you would raise about private property. Um, in fact, there was another issue raised about state ownership, right? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember the numbers correctly, it's, I think, um, something like 94%, or maybe it's less than that, of land in South Africa is privately owned. So you don't, the state doesn't own that much land. And the land that the state owns and controls, some of it is not even um, uh, arable for farming or can be used for habitation. But what the state has, are levers. The state has power. This, I mean, you know, states have always, you know, used eminent domain and other kinds of means to take land. <coughs> and so private land uh, should be on the block, on, on, should be available, to be, you know, um, commanded and transformed. And you're so right. There is a fetish with private property. That is the world we grew up in. And breaking from private property is, is like, it's way harder than like getting a divorce. It's like, you're, we're so wedded to private property um, that it's hard to even imagine that. And part of the, the anarchist tradition, the socialist tradition, uh, you know, is a critique of private property. And it's also an understanding of where private, private property comes from, you know. So I think we, we have to sort of do a lot of education work to think about what's beyond it and also to understand not just in scientific terms but in indigenous terms because when we talk about ancestral land, that's not something you roll over. You don't say, well, yeah, that's, that's old school. No, ancestral land means that you're, what's, what's behind there 
is not just history, but actual ancestors, you know, who are both, their bodies might be in the ground, but their spirits are still circulating. And I, w I always tell the story about, I'm not gonna tell the whole story, but you know, there are places, you know, reserves where there are ancestors buried on these reserves and the reserves are owned by foreign capital, like Dubai World. So what does that mean? One thing to have a lot of private land, but then to have privately, privately owned land from international capital. That's why I say, we gotta think internationally. You can't not think just within the nation. Um, and again, this is everywhere. This is, this, South Africa is not unique, everywhere. If you start to pull out the deeds and find out who owns land, you'll be shocked by how much it's owned by other people outside. And so the demand for the restoration of ancestral lands should be a fundamental demand of everyone. And that's something we're fighting for in the United States. You know, the return of the land, land back. It, and land back doesn't always mean that people are gonna be then dispossessed and the land's gonna be returned to some old way of thinking. It's about respect and dignity and reconnecting with roots our ancestors, and understanding that land is not property. Land became property thanks to what? Liberalism. It wasn't property before. Property is, you know, we, sometimes we conflate those things. Land is something different. Land is alive, you know? So I don't know if that answers the question. I hope I answered everything. These are hard questions. Um, okay. One of the trust members, Peter Jacobs, just to do the vote of thanks on behalf of the trust. Thanks, uh, Martin, and the, uh, all the, the, the audience. Uh, I just have a long list here of people to thank, uh, but uh, I'd love to start with uh, the University of Cape Town for uh, allowing the trust to uh, utilize this venue, uh, the Neville Alexander Auditorium. Uh, we really appreciate uh, their willingness to um, allow us to use the venue. Uh, then uh, to Toko Madonko, uh, the poet, who uh, really presented us with uh, very inspiring and memorable uh, poems. Then to the, uh, to the caterers uh, called Time Catering uh, for uh, providing some of the refreshments. Uh, Workers World Media is, uh, of course, part of a media collective. And uh, the specific other groups in the media collective would be Cape Town TV for uh, enabling the trust to have a, a live uh, uh, streaming and broadcast of the, of the event. Uh, so, this was made possible not only by uh, Cape Town TV, but the wonderful staff of Workers World Media. Uh, even though we are only thanking them for being here and helping us, but we, uh, the trust, uh, since its inception, relied quite heavily on Workers World Media uh, production and the staff in the office to make all these events possible and each and every event uh, a reality. And then, of course, we come to uh, our speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Robin Kelly, for coming uh, to us. <laughs> and and we, we as, as a trust, we work together to uh, allow Robin to come here, but it was actually Kelly Gillespie who really made a lot of the effort in order to reach out to Robin and ensure that uh, you know everything works well. But once again, it was Workers World Media that made uh, everything possible. Robin Kelly's lecture. <laughs> I, I think Robin Robin Kelly's lecture lived up to what we wanted to happen tonight. He left us with a very important question and a message. The importance of history 
as the key to unlock future possibilities. That's a very powerful message. Taking us on this long pathway throughout history where oppressed masses, where they come and rise up again with new courage to resist. So thanks, Robin, for bringing us that very important message and encouraging, encouraging all of us to go back to history books, to open our history books, because there we will find the keys to unlock future possibilities. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah. I think specific mention needs to be made of Leah Naidu for her support, as well as Lita Tulu and others. Um, really, really been helpful. Uh, comrades, that's it. We've come to the end of the program. Thank you for attending, for participating. Also those online, those far away. And we hope to see you next year again at the next lecture. Thank you very much. Good night and good luck.